everyone. Uh, welcome to today's panel. Uh, my name is Camila Bustos and I'm a board member of Beach Collective. Um, and it's a pleasure to join you all today um, and to be facilitating this panel with rockstar colleagues and friends. Um, so just as a form of introduction today, um, you know, we'll be talking about corporate accountability and the playbook that a lot of fossil fuel companies and front groups have used to evade climate action and scrutiny. Um, as some of you might be familiar with, we've known that fossil fuel companies, especially big oil and big gas, uh, have known for decades that climate change is real, um, that climate change is being driven by um, the combustion of their products, and instead of making that information public and trying to pivot their business, um, they have masterminded decades-long, multi-million dollar campaign of denial, disinformation, and deception, um, basically to hide all of this science um, and to stifle climate action when possible. Similarly, frac gas utilities and their front groups have known about the public health climate risks of their product long before um, the general public knew. And instead of pivoting their business, uh, they've doubled down in a campaign of science misinformation, um, denial, and opposition to regulation at all levels of government. Um, employing, again, many of the same tactics that we've seen uh, first used actually by tobacco industry um, and more recently by the carbon majors. Industry front groups for both utilities and carbon majors play a crucial role in coordinating a lot of this messaging and strategy, um, both within and outside fossil fuel sectors. Um, and these front groups have also been in charge of essentially trying to preempt any local regulation through um, state level legislation. So today we're going to be discussing some of the similarities and the differences um, that you know some is, uh, across these entities, um, as well as the legal remedies that are currently being pursued or could potentially be pursued to tackle some of uh, these harms. So with that, I am going to introduce our panelists and then pass it on to them. So to my right, I have Danny. Danny is a climate and energy strategist at Breach Collective and is based in Eugene, Oregon. At Breach, Danny provides broad-ranging legal, policy, communications, and strategic support to campaigns with a focus on supporting building electrification and opposing expansion of gas infrastructure. His earlier career focused on climate change litigation and included developing and supporting landmark climate change lawsuits in Europe, the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Originally from Sydney, Australia, Danny holds a JD from Sydney Law School and is licensed to practice in the Australian state of New South Wales. To the right of Danny, we have Naomi. Naomi is a legal fellow at the Center for Climate Integrity and is based out of DC. At CCI, Naomi works with legal, political, and research teams to support administrative, legislative, and judicial avenues for holding fossil fuel companies accountable for their decades of deception, with a focus on developing legal theories to advance climate accountability. Before she was a lawyer, Naomi was a technical reviewer for an organic food certifier. Naomi holds a JD from Berkeley Law and is licensed to practice in the state of California. And last but not least, we have Nick. Um, Nick serves as a climate and energy attorney at Breach Collective, providing legal and strategic support to grassroots partners around the country. He has significant experience in climate, energy, and air quality law and policy. He has a unique knowledge of municipal, municipal level strategies for restricting the activities of the fossil fuel industry, having been deeply involved in efforts to prohibit fossil fuel infrastructure in Portland and throughout the Pacific Northwest. So uh, please give a round of applause to our Rockstar pilot. Thank you, Camila, um, and thank you all for coming. This is quite the turnout. Um, so I'm going to kick this off, starting to talk about the carbon majors <coughs> and, <laughs> and about climate liability litigation. Um, climate liability litigation seeks to hold the major fossil fuel companies accountable for fraud and deception and the resulting harms. Uh, at their core, these cases are about shifting the costs that communities are facing from taxpayers to polluters. They're about compensating for harm and seeking to recover for the cost of adaptation and resilience. And they're about bringing an end to climate deception. So the current wave of climate uh, liability litigation started in 2017 when three California municipalities filed suit against major fossil fuel companies. Since then, uh, seven states in D.C., 35 municipalities, and one industry trade association 
um, have filed suit. Um, these, all these uh, cases, they have a diversity of claims. Some of the early one, earlier ones were focused on um, public nuisance claims and other common law torts. Then we started to see more uh, product liability claims and consumer fraud based off of both common law and consumer protection statutes. A lot of states, including Oregon, have statutes that broadly prohibit unfair and deceptive acts. Um, and then most recently, a case was filed at the end of last year by uh, 16 Puerto Rican communities for racketeering charges against the fossil fuel companies. Um, and all of those, with the exception of the Puerto Rican, uh, the Puerto Rican case, were filed in state court. So regardless of the claims of these cases, they all follow the same narrative. They knew, they lied, they should be held accountable. The fossil fuel companies knew for decades that their products were causing climate change. They lied rather than warning the public and policymakers um, about these harms. They hid it and obfuscated the truth, and they should be held accountable. The impacts of climate change are incredibly harmful and expensive. In 2022, there were 18 separate billion dollar uh, weather and climate disaster events in the United States. And this continues an eight-year trend where there are 10 or more billion-dollar such events. Um, so these cases, they shift the burden of addressing the costs of, these, of climate change from the taxpayers to carbon majors, all of whom, by the way, I'm sure you saw the reports, um, had record profits in 2022. Um, in these cases, as Camila said, they follow the same, um, they're really modeled after tobacco cases, opioid, lead paint, and then more recently and closer to home, the PCB litigation against Monsanto that recently settled used the same, they knew, they lied, and they were held accountable. So to illustrate this, I'm going to do two separate case studies, um, one that's more on the cost recovery side and the other that is a consumer protection case. So the first one is the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Association versus Chevron. This was filed in November 2018 in California State Court by a trade association that's made up of California and Oregon fishermen um, for impacts to the seafood industry. Um, the major impact alleged in this claim, or in this case, um, is the effects of uh, warming ocean, and specifically the blob, which um, many of you may remember from 2013 to 2016. It was this massive warm water that was floating in the Pacific for three years. And it led to an increase in a specific kind of marine algae that creates uh, demoic acid. And when humans ingest demoic acid at certain levels, um, it can cause this thing called um, amnesic shellfish poisoning, and we might ingest that through uh, Dungeness crabs. And so this had a huge impact on um, whether or not these Dungeness crabs could be harvested. So there were certain sections of the coast that were considered contaminated zones. And even after the blob went away and all the algae died, uh, the demoic acid stayed. It settled down into the sediment, and so it continues to impact these areas. Um, and so these contaminated zones off the Oregon coast, off the California coast, um, they led to shortened seasons, sometimes um, closing off certain sections, and they, um, they had a huge impact on the profits that the industry could make. So the claims in this case include public nuisance, negligence, failure to warn, and the crux <coughs> is that the defendants understood the dangers of their products and causing climate change, and yet they deceived the public and thus brought about these conditions. The remedies in this case include compensation for the losses suffered for the coastal closures and adaptation costs to mitigate future damages and other damages. So the second one is a consumer protection case, and this is uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts versus Exxon. So I didn't mention, but in the previous case, um, they filed 30 separate fossil fuel companies, and in this case, they only filed against Exxon. And this was tailored to specifically um, uh, it was to specifically align with Massachusetts uh, Consumer Protection Act. Uh, and so it was filed in October 2019, just against Exxon. Um, and the claims that they made were for deceiving investors, deceiving consumers, 
uh, for failing to disclose that normal use of their product would lead to climate change, um, and then also deceiving uh, consumers through greenwashing campaigns. The crux in this case is that Exxon's misrepresentations um, about the role of their fossil fuel products uh, are material to consumer purchasing decisions, and they distorted the market for energy products and technology. Remedies in this case include it's, uh, what was available through the statute, so it's injunctive relief to halt future deceptive practices, and monetary penalties for each instance of the statutory violation. And then these are just two examples. You guys saw the map earlier. A number of, the, of other cases bring both consumer protection and cost recovery claims. Um, so to make these cases, we need evidence to back them up. Uh, both PCFFA and Massachusetts rely on similar underlying body of evidence, um, both scientific and factual. So I'm going to start off with the scientific side. Um, the scientific community, and as we'll discuss in a moment, and as you all know, the fossil fuel industry has known for decades that the anthropogenic burning of fossil fuels uh, causes global warming through the greenhouse effect. Um, and that such climatic warming has catastrophic impacts, including warming ocean temperatures, rising sea levels, and increased occurrences of extreme weather events. But we still need a way to link uh, these emissions that are causing climate change to individual fossil fuel companies. So that's where attribution science comes in. In 2014, um, climate scientist Richard Heed authored the Carbon Majors Report, which helped to identify um, who is responsible and the named defendants in the cases. So Heed researched annual reports and reporting documents um, and published his results showing that nearly two-thirds or 65 percent of all industrial emissions from the Industrial Revolution can be traced back to 90 carbon producers. These are both investor and state-owned companies, um, including ExxonMobil, BP, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, Shell, and others. Of those 90, 50 investor-owned companies account for more than 20% of historic emissions. Um, some cases as well um, allege that specific extreme events are the result of climate change. So in the example of the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen, um, they, uh, and this is the blob, um, attribution science plays a role in that as well to show that climate change uh, increased the probability that that would occur, the severity, um, and so science plays a huge role in that as well. The second part of the evidentiary story is the factual evidence. Um, the they knew they lied portion, and this is all based off of thousands of pages of internal industry documents, many of which was revealed through investigative journalism. So. As early as the 1950s and no later than 1968, fossil fuel companies had knowledge about the harms associated with their products. This is a report um, prepared for the American Petroleum Institute, which is an industry association that pretty much all the big players are uh, a member of. And it is summarizing its own findings on carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It says 1968, quote, Man is now engaged in a vast geographical or geophysical experiment with its, his environment, the Earth. Significant temperature changes are almost certain to occur by the year 2000 and could bring about climate changes. There seems to be no doubt about the potential damage to our environment and could be severe. Uh, these companies were on the cutting edge of climate science. Exxon, in particular, ran innovative research programs oftentimes working with academic and government scientists. A recent study by Jeffrey Suprin, Stephen Ramsoff, and Naomi Oreskes compared um, Exxon's models with actual climate outcomes and found that Exxon models were, quote, breathtakingly accurate. And you can see that on this slide. Um, it's really wild. Um, as of the late 1970s, it was clear that there was no uncertainty with respect to causes and consequences of climate change, with many fossil fuel companies predicting, quote, catastrophic effects, like this report from Exxon in 1982. But in the mid-1980s, the tables turned. Industry began to recognize climate change and the threat of regulation as a threat to their bottom line. 
1978, Exxon's own research found that, quote, CO2 release uh, is the most likely source of inadvertent climate modification. But in 1988, they stated that their position was to emphasize uncertainty in scientific conclusions and that they were going to be providing leadership uh, to the API to develop this industry position. Similarly, in 1988, Shell's internal reporting states, quote, the changes from climate change may be the greatest in, record, in recorded history and that once global warming uh, becomes detectable, it could be too late to take effective countermeasures. But in 1994, despite their own findings, Shell stated that their group position was that, quote, scientific uncertainty and the evolution of energy systems indicate that policies to curb greenhouse gas emissions beyond no regret measures could be premature. So these companies actively concealed what they knew. What they were reporting internally was different than what they were reporting externally. They ran misleading nationwide campaigns to create doubt and uncertainty, such as this publication um, on the left by the API entitled, Making the Right Choice. It states, no conclusive or even strongly suggestive scientific evidence exists that human activities are significantly affecting sea levels rainfall, surface temperatures, or the intensity and frequency of storms. But as we know, Exxon was um, helping API develop this position, and we've seen their research. Um, notes from this task force from 1980 conclude that they expected the global average, uh, increase, a global average temperature increase of 2.5 degrees Celsius by 2035, which would result, in their own words, major economic consequences. Uh, these groups or these companies also funded scientists in front groups to promote uncertainty and contrarian theories. Uh, these front groups had green sounding names like the Global Climate Coalition or the Global Climate Science Communications Team, but they had stated missions to defeat international climate negotiations and achieving victory when, quote, the average citizen understands uncertainties in climate science and that recognition of uncertainties becomes part of the conventional wisdom. So this is all in direct contradiction to their own research and actions that they took to protect their own assets, such as um, raising offshore oil platforms to account for sea level rise. And today the deception continues. Um, we say from denial to duplicity, as in they're no longer outright denying that climate change is happening, but they're pulling a bait and switch and trying to say that they're part of the solution when they're really not. Um, the carbon majors claim that they are substantially invested in low carbon uh, technology and renewable energy sources, but the numbers are not so substantial. Uh, from 2010 to 2018, BP invested only 2.3% of its total capital expenditures on low carbon or renewables. And that was a high number. Um, Shell only had 1.2, and Chevron and Exxon had 0.2%. They also claim that their products are clean and green, but as we'll get into in a minute, natural gas produces methane that's 86 times more potent than CO2 in near-term warming. They also claim that they're sustainable energy companies, but they all plan on increasing production, and in fact, they've even Call, they even say that increased production needs to be part of an energy transition. In the next 20 years, they view it as a time of increased investment in production, and this includes increased investment in front groups. Um, front groups are created to say and lobby for things that the companies themselves don't have the social license to do. In uh, a report by the uh, Union for Concerned Scientists found that Exxon provided over $37 million to climate science denier organizations from 1998 to 2019. And even today, Big Oil refuses to uh, divest from these front groups. There was a congressional hearing in 2021 where uh, a congressperson specifically asked them whether they would commit to defunding these groups, and they all declined to do so. So where are we now? Um, to wrap up the, the cases that I used um, as the examples before and before I hand it off, um, many of these climate liability cases are in the midst of this uh, removal and remand fight. So as I mentioned, 
All of them, with the exception of the most recent Puerto Rico case, um, have been filed in state court. Defendants removed it to federal court, and then um, the plaintiffs then uh, sought for remand. Five circuit courts, including the 19th Circuit and 13 district courts, have all ruled unanimously that these cases do belong in state court. However, there is a petition um, for uh, review in another case, Boulder v. Suncor, before the Supreme Court on this very question, and we'll have to wait and see. They haven't decided whether they're granting cert on that. Um, but there is good news. Massachusetts and Honolulu, which is another case, um, they're in active discovery right now. And so uh, we'll see where that goes. It's exciting. It's rapidly developing. Um, and I'm going to hand it off to Danny over here to talk about the connection to local utilities. Thanks, Naomi. That was awesome. Um, can folks see me OK at the back? Sweet. Um, Hi everyone, uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about local utilities. Um, just as a little bit of context or background, uh, utilities are interesting in the Pacific Northwest, particularly leading out of that discussion because up here we, we're not a side of fossil fuel production, you know, we're not the Permian, we're not the Gulf Coast, we don't have major fossil fuel, fuel producers in our backyard. Also thanks to a long-term grassroots campaign, series of major organizing wins. We don't really have any major fossil fuel export terminals that were slated to be built over the last, you know, 10, 15 years uh, here. So when we think about what fossil fuel communications and agenda and information folks in this region are interacting with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's the utilities. And the sort of key policy questions in this region are you know, around the energy transition, how quickly we move, what regulations and what tools are needed. And that's where um, we've seen in the last couple of years, um, gas utility uh, disinformation has kind of hit uh, overdrive. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. And what we've noticed with some of those <coughs> tactics and the kind of playbook they're employing is it's the same playbook that the carbon majors have employed. It's the same playbook that uh, tobacco, the tobacco industry employed um, it's the same that I, I assume asbestos industry <laughs> employed, you know, decades ago. It's the same sort of corporate sort of disinformation package. So um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the sort of the factual parallels and also some of the nuances and differences that exist um, around utilities. Um, and I am going to focus on our friendly local uh, billion dollar Wall Street owned um, utility Northwest Natural um, because uh, that's where my knowledge is strongest, but this is a playbook that we've seen being played out throughout the country. And as I'll get into when talking about the, the front groups, in some ways this is a truly globally coordinated strategy through some trade associations. All right, so yes, just like the carbon majors, gas utilities knew about the climate and public health harms of their product. They knew that there were ways to reduce those harms. They developed in private technologies to reduce those harms. Then they failed to do so. They started casting doubt on the science. They started greenwashing their product. And they fought regulation every step of the way so that they can maintain a business model, maintain profits, maintain investments, increase hookups. That's the sort of overarching um, theory of liability from a factual standpoint. So um, this hasn't been as well documented, I would say, as a lot of the stuff um, that the carbon majors have engaged in. Um, I think there's a few different reasons for that, but um, recently we're, we're starting to see some of this being documented quite well. So this is, um, you know, and, and some of this came out of the uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission saying, oh, we're looking at potentially prohibiting gas stoves and the sort of culture war that ignited federally uh, in the last month or two. Um, but this is from... Um, I'm blanking on her name, the, the person who does Drilled podcast. Amy Westerville. Amy Westerville, thank you. Uh, this is from Amy Westerville's blog. Um, and I've, I've included the link, I recommend checking that out. But sort of, she goes through just some sort of key milestones in gas utility knowledge over the last century or so, you know, even going back to 1901. Um, I'm just going to point to this one in particular. This is from a National Academy of Sciences report in 1981 
that was, uh, you know, making clear that there were connections between, in this case, carbon monoxide concentrations and health risks from indoor combustion of, of, of gas via gas stoves and other gas appliances. Um, this was in uh, NPR a couple of weeks back uh, by Jeff Brady, and as I was talking about, gas the gas industry knew how to knew about the risks, and they started to address them in the sort of R and D aspect. They developed these infrared burning stoves that had much lower nitrogen dioxide emissions. Nitrogen dioxide is an air pollutant that is produced when methane is combusted, um, and it exacerbates asthma risk. And that's not scientifically controversial at all. Those are pretty clearly understood um, epidemiological facts. Uh, so, um, yeah, back in the 80s, the gas industry developed this infrared burner that had, I think, lower greenhouse gas emissions, lower nitrogen dioxide emissions, more efficient. But it didn't have the blue flame. And the blue flame was a big marketing point for them. So it never really got pushed to market. Um, in contrast, and I probably should have included a slide on this, a lot of Northwest Naturals communications circa 2010 to 2017 or so were all about their new efficient gas stove appliances and their slogan was like efficient, affordable, blue. So they were, they were marketing more, you know, 30 years later they're marketing more efficient conventional gas stoves with the blue flame when they had an even more efficient one developed in the 80s that they just never pushed to market. So, yeah. Um, and this is another seminal piece um, in the last couple of years from Rebecca Lieber that sort of gets into a lot of the, you know, clever marketing um, that the gas industry entered into uh, to make sure that um, Americans perceived gas stoves as a superior product to elect electric stoves. Um, I don't really like gas stoves personally. I mean, I, I understand, like, if you have, like, a top-of-the-line burner, but I'm, I'm a renter. Most rental houses that I've been in with a gas stove, it's... Nick used to have one that was probably built in like 1947. <laughs> um, and I dog sat from a few times and you just have to like open every window when it was on because you, you could feel your lungs constricting. It's crazy. Um, yeah, so that's, that's some of the sort of history of the denial, but this is still something that's going on uh, today. And here's another uh, favorite sort of corporate tactic. And this again is our friendly local um, investor owned utility, uh, Northwest Natural. Um, on the front page of the New York Times, getting a little bit of hot water for um, engaging a, a scientist from a consulting firm called Gradient. Um, this firm uh, pretty much exclusively works with um, major polluters um, whenever they're looking to have some kind of uh, expert evidence to evade regulation. And lo and behold, the experts at Gradient always seem to find that whatever the thing that's going to be Regulated, it's it's always benign to human health, despite you know what 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 other folks are saying. It's always you know it's it's benign. Tobacco is benign. You know, uh, coal's benign. Oil's benign, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and yeah, uh, Dr. Julie Goodman from Gradient uh, presented at a Multnomah County hearing uh, around a report that they were releasing on the health impacts from gas stoves. That found that there was a connection, and tried to sort of uh, challenge the literature, cast out on the literature and also failed to disclose in the public testimony that, that she was being paid to represent and was there on behalf of Northwest Natural. Um, and here's some direct advertising that Northwest Natural engages in um, around uh, cooking. And the main talking points they enter into is uh, ventilation is key regardless, however you cook, ventilation is key to lowering air pollutants. And that's true as far as um, particulate pollution is concerned, PM 2.5, you know, like if smoke, if you burn something, you know, you're producing particulates. Whenever you cook, you are producing particulates. And that is an air pollutant. Um, but what gas stoves produce that electric stoves do not produce as a matter of chemistry is nitrogen dioxide. Um, so they're being a little bit deceptive there in the sense that they're not, they're talking about ventilation being key no matter how you cook. But in, if you're cooking with electric, you don't have to worry about some of those pollutants. Um, the other thing that's been shown is that, uh, or at least what the evidence seems to indicate in the literature, is that ventilation is effective at removing particulates. It's not effective at removing nitrogen dioxide, so it's not as effective. Um, part of that reason is just, the, I guess, the different molecular weight of nitrogen dioxide versus sort of ambient air, making it a little bit harder to 
get rid of. And we had uh, one of the local nonprofits, um, Beyond Toxics, went to a few homes uh, earlier in January, I think, or early February. They went with a forward-looking infrared camera to capture the emissions that were coming from gas appliances, and they had the ventilation hood on, and you could see just a lot of the a lot of the uh, combustion, a lot of the emissions were just escaping ventilation. So you'd have to have a really powerful hood that's running, I mean, for, for some of the things, because there, there is additional evidence showing that gas stoves also leak uh, methane and other, and other uh, co-pollutants uh, even when they're not in use. So if you feel like running a high-powered fan 24-7, you're probably good. If not, um, you, you're going to be having some level of exposure to air pollutants. Can I just... Yeah. And this is from Northwest Naturals website. And if you do like a term search for any of these pollutants on Northwest Naturals website, just go do it. I guarantee you will not find any of them listed. All of their information about air quality is just like about how bad all cooking is and never sort of like what are the particular problems with gas. All right. So that's some of the... Uh, fundamental science denial that they've been engaging in. Um, they've also been litigating against regulation. So this is an, a letter to their customers talking about how they just had to uh, challenge the um, Oregon Department of Vi Environmental Quality's Climate Protection Program, which would enforce you know, mandatory emissions reduction um, requirements on Northwest Natural and a number of other major polluters in the state. So they're currently challenging that regulation in court as we speak. Um, and then there's behind the scenes, uh, I don't know if Northwest Natural is doing this, but I do know that a number of other fossil fuel uh, companies and trade groups have been working on, uh, and the American Gas Association has developed template legislation for this, preempting local regulation at the, um, well, yeah, at the state level. So this is a map, the, um, the deep uh, magenta, I suppose, um, states are ones that have passed. Um, state laws preempting any kind of local regulation. Um, the blue ones, and Oregon should now be deep blue since Eugene passed one earlier this month, um, are ones that have sort of proposed or, or introduced or passed local regulation. Um, and there's been, I think, 97 or 98 um, cities or counties that have passed some kind of um, prohibition or regulation on uh, gas use in buildings um, in the last few years. Uh, but you can sort of see there's a sort of counter strategy, particularly in uh, more conservative leaning states, to prevent uh, the sort of, I guess, liberal centres of those states from, um, and the more environmentally conscious municipalities, from taking any measures to restrict um, get new gas hookups. Um, and similarly, there's been a really um, full press. Uh, lobbying campaign um, both before and after the passage of the ordinance in Eugene. So this is one of the full page ads, um, just a list of names. We don't know who they are or where they're from for the most part. This, this seems C uh, CEO of Northwest Natural and also uh, the outgoing chair of the um, American Ga Gas Association who's still on their board. His name's David Anderson and there's, there's about half a dozen Andersons on there. There's like a really over-representation of people with the last name Anderson, which makes me think that maybe there's a some, some family members, not confirmed, but just as a little, little bit suspicious to me. Um, he's a president of Lake Oswego, so he's, he's not, not a Eugenian. Um, but, you know, that was, that was one attempt they did at sort of trying to sway public opinion. Um, the most recent one is they've dropped uh, over... Six, Northwest Natural has dropped over $670,000 in the last two weeks, according to Oregon Secretary of State filings, into a, uh, a petition committee that was established by their PAC manager two days after the ordinance passed. Um, and they've been, they've dropped at least, three, was it $350,000 to, to a signature gathering firm. Uh, so I don't know, if any students here on campus might have seen these folks wearing their green jackets and stuff the last couple of weeks, getting people to sign a referendum petition that would overturn the ordinance. This is the first that we know of attempt by a fossil fuel company to uh, overturn an ordinance that's being passed in this way um, by via a via the ballot. Um, so this is a, a fairly new tactic that we're seeing uh, right here in Eugene, Oregon. 
Um, I'm going to pivot now to the greenwashing. So the way I sort of conceive of the gas industry strategy in more progressive states where there is um, the threat or reality of um, climate regulations that will require them to reduce emissions is a little bit of the sort of bait and switch that Naomi was talking about. So the bait is, oh, we're going to be a net zero gas utility by 2050 and here's all these amazing technologies that we're going to bring on and some of them are already in the pipeline and we already have these pilot projects here, there and everywhere. Um, and oh, there's so much potential for, for renewable natural gas and green hydrogen and methanated hydrogen, which is just, um, it's literally producing methane from, from hydrogen. So it's producing a fossil fuel from an energy intensive uh, gas to produce. It's wild stuff. Um, but they're like, oh look, we're going to be a net zero energy company, uh, but don't regulate us. And you're not allowed, you don't have the authority to, and we're going to overturn your ballot ordinance. But, but it's okay because we're going to, you know, we're going to be a net zero company. Um, so, and so we don't need to electrify because we're going to have a decarbonized gas system. We're going to have renewable no molecules of freedom uh, flowing under the ground, um, you know, powering your home. And yeah, don't worry about the air quality picks either because the science isn't established there. Um, I think this is a pretty illustrative um, example of, and it's a graph and I'll explain it to you, um, but it will be illustrative once I explain it to you. Um, of the difference between, particularly in Eugene, uh, electrification and the net zero energy system. So these are cumulative emissions over time um, from uh, Eugene's current grid, which is EWEB. And then this is the, this is Northwest Natural's decarbonization plan. This isn't like business as usual. This is like, with, this is when they hit net zero. So when they hit net zero, a home um, starting in 2022, we'll have 50 megatons of CO2 emissions cumulatively by 2050, and you'll have, what was that, 10 if you switch to electric. So you're going to have five times the cumulative emissions from that net zero gas system than you would if you just electrify. Um, so I, I hope folks understand the significance of that, that like, who cares if you're a net zero gas utility if like right now you're in, in like, two or three years, you're going to be producing more emissions than a home that switched to electric appliances would produce in like 20 or 30. So that's kind of the bait and switch there. And then, yeah, this was sort of the, this is, you know, I was sort of lampooning it a bit, but this is a literal quote from Northwest Natural. Two energy systems carrying renewable electrons along wires and renewable and clean molecules and pipes provides greater resilience, reduces risks and limits cost impacts for energy users. All of those claims at the end could be challenged. Um, and then this is from a few years ago um, and it's just more sort of outlining their kind of strategy to convince consumers that uh, green hydrogen and other types of hydrogen and renewable natural gas are, you know, preferable to electrification and that, um, you know, if you connect to the, to the grid, you're not actually reducing emissions, even though that graph I showed you directly contradicts that point. Um, because, you know, gas is still being used for generation, even though Eugene's grid, for example, is already 95, 90% plus decarbonized. Um, they're also spending a lot of time trying to convince us that these renewables are already in the system. Um, when in reality, uh, yeah, again, another graph. I love graphs. Um, so as you can see, Eugene's grid is already around 90%. Renewables. This is from a uh, good company, a consultant firm in Eugene that produced this for the city of Eugene. Um, whereas uh, right now, Northwest Naturals are, uh, looks like maybe two, three percent, something like that. Um, and you know they'll they'll hit uh, they'll hit ten percent renewables in 2030. That's that's pretty good. You know, a round of applause, pat on the back for for Northwest Natural, and they'll hit sixty percent by 2050. So, yeah, and and that's again that's their own plan. This is their plan. This is not business as usual. Um, but yeah, they've, you know, and this is just sort of showing a little bit of the parallels that, um, you know, Northwest Natural right now is saying, destination zero, this plan is our way to comply with the regulations that we're suing to invalidate. Um, I think if they're successful, I hope they're not, but if they're somehow successful with their legal strategy and they invalidate the climate protection program, I think we'll see what, um, what Shell and a few other carbon majors have announced recently is they'll be like, oh yeah, that, that um, net zero by 2050 plan, yeah, that's, you know, 
economic headwinds and whatnot, uh, you know, uh, supply constraints, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, we're, we're not going to be net zero by 2050 anymore. Sorry, we'll be net zero by 2070 or something. You know, they'll just kick the can. But right now, they're, they're still trying to sort of bluff us into thinking that they're going to, uh, to do it. I'm going to talk really quickly about, I'm just looking at the time. I think I'm okay. You're totally good. Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk quickly about just some finer details of these technologies that they're promoting as a decarbonization solution and what the reality is of them. So this is from a coalition of groups, I, I think including the Sierra Club, Green Energy Institute, and a few others, um, Climate Solutions. Their testimony uh, challenging uh, Northwest Natural's uh, requested rate increase um, last year. And uh, I'm going to explain this uh, in, in uh, chart form in a second. Um, but basically, because um, that, that sounds really technical, and I would say it's almost intentionally complicated to sort of hide the fact, to hide a few key points. So um, for the CLE types, you can study that all you want. You can read the hundreds of pages of briefs if that's something you're interested in. But for the rest of us, um, here is a graph. So this red state is the state of Nebraska. Um, and, uh, and everyone should recognize that as Oregon, as the green state. Um, and basically what happens here is um, Northwest Natural has entered into a contract with, I think, Tyson Foods to produce renewable natural gas. Now, Tyson Foods is a massive agricultural conglomerates. They do very sort of concentrated agricultural operations. So to represent that, I have a sort of chicken, uh, fit, you know, sort of battery chicken lot. So what they do is they take the excrement and other waste from their um, operations. There are some emissions, of course, associated with the uh, digesters and, you know, actually sort of processing and, you know, uh, purifying the, the gas that you receive. And then normally it would just you know, Nebraska Gas Utility would just buy it directly if they wanted it. But what Northwest Natural does is it steps in between and says, hold on, hold on. Um, hey, local Nebraska Gas Utility, um, we, you're not really, you don't really have any climate regulations in Nebraska, but we do. So what we're going to do is we're going to buy the gas and then we're going to sell it to you, but we're going to keep the renewable thermal credits. So we'll keep the renewable thermal credits. And what that will allow us to do is pretend that the frac gas that we get from in Oregon that comes to us from Colorado and Canada, we're going to apply our renewable thermal credits to that frac gas and pretend it's renewable natural gas. Um, in exchange, because we took the renewable thermal credits, you have to pretend that this chicken feedlot gas that you're getting came from fracking, came from conventional sources. Um, so you just pretend that it's, you don't get to claim any emissions reduction benefit from it or renewable component, but we get to claim it in Oregon. And that's essentially what most of the renewables in that graph that I showed you um, a few slides ago, that's what Northwest Natural is saying their renewables are. It's renewable thermal credits applied to fracked gas. So there's essentially zero um, gas in the pipeline at the moment. This sort of shows the switch that, you know, was fracked gas, now they get to call it RNG, and then, oh, sorry, yeah, got the wrong got the wrong clicker, um, and then Nebraska has to call it conventional gas. You can see that's kind of complicated and difficult to understand, and you kind of have to, like, I, I sort of have to repeat the point a few times for it to really hit home, that it's, it's just frack gas. The RN, they have this ad saying RNG is coming home, but it's frack gas with renewable thermal credits applied to it on a sheet of paper is coming home. Is, you know. um, similarly, there are a few uh, RNG pilot facility uh, yeah, pilot projects in Oregon. But my understanding is what they're doing with that is um, they're selling the carbon credits from that RNG to the transportation emissions market in California, and they're treating it as conventional gas in Oregon. So they don't really care about the emissions reduction component right now. They're just selling that on a carbon market in California. So it's just this kind of shell game where they're just moving emissions around on paper, outsourcing emissions to states that don't have climate regulations, and claiming that they're on the path to a net zero utility. I mean, it's a joke. Um, and then this uh, is just a quick slide on hydrogen. No what Northwest Natural wants to do is blend hydrogen in quantities anywhere from sort of 5 to 20% with, um, with methane in the system. Um, one of the uh, studied side effects of this is it actually increases NO2 emissions in the home as a sort of chemical 
reaction, so you're creating a worse indoor air quality if you do this. Um, also, 20% is the sort of technical limit, and it, even that seems like it could be really unsafe um, in existing gas pipeline infrastructure. There's a heightened uh, explosion risk um, from doing this. Um, and it's only, and it's one of the most expensive um, uh, forms of uh, emissions reductions that you can get in that sector. It's very expensive to produce hydrogen right now, and it's going to be for some time. So it's a little bit uh, indulgent, I would say, of Northwest Natural. And they wanted to pilot a project in West Eugene, which is a region that already has, um, is already in, has one of the highest percentiles of uh, asthma cases in, um, in the country. Uh, in that neighbourhood, they wanted to pilot the project there. So um, a number of community groups objected to that and then they, Northwest Natural, pretty quickly withdrew the project citing um, a lack of community engagement. Um, but I don't think any amount of community engagement is going to convince that neighbourhood that it's, it's a good idea to uh, worsen the, their indoor air quality for you know, marginal emissions reductions. Um, this is a slide from uh, an Oregon Department of Energy presentation. I think there is actually a presentation on hydrogen later today that a DOE person, this DOE person, is, is giving. Um, and you can see, it might be, I think it's, it's fairly visible, but down here I think this is sort of showing sort of best to worst use cases of, of hydrogen. And it looks like uh, resident domestic heating is, is an F. So it's, it's just about the worst use case you can think of. For, um, for hydrogen. The, to the extent that hydrogen should be used as a decarbonisation solution, it should be in difficult to electrify processes, um, industrial processes, um, etc. And you can sort of see that in this. Um, but that, at a, a house hearing, um, an Oregon uh, House Environment Committee hearing uh, early this, earlier in February, uh, the DOE spokesperson was saying basically RNG and hydrogen are the only way, that was a quote, the only way um, that Northwest Natural can comply with the climate protection program. So we're going to see more attempts to sort of build out and, and mix hydrogen into the gas system over time. All right, so that was my, my big spiel about um, Northwest Natural. I'm now going to talk really quickly about front groups um, and then I'm going to pass to Nick to talk a little bit about remedies. I think that's the order, right? Yeah. Um, so we're seeing some coordination between leading uh, gas and fossil fuel producer trade associations. Um, this was a memo that came out late last year before the House switched, um, coming out of some of the um, hearings that Naomi was talking about. Um, and there was only a, a little sort of tidbit in here, um, because, and it actually came in a, in a section where they were sort of criticising the lack of disclosure and response to subpoenas that the fossil fuel trade associations entered into, but I think it's indicative that there might be more if, if folks are able to somehow uncover some of these documents. So, yeah, it mentions that the American Petroleum Institute redacted emails to representatives of other oil and gas trade associations, including the American Gas Association, which is sort of the leading trade association for gas utilities, and as I mentioned, uh, has Northwest Natural's CEO on their board, and, and he was recently the chair. Um, with the subject line, reconciliation, coordination, referring essentially to lobbying uh, around the Inflation Reduction Act. And if we go to the next slide, um, this is, um, this came from, I'm wondering if that's in the right order. It'll have to do for now. Um, this is from the American Gas Association talking about their sort of local um, front group strategy. Um, and one of the things they mention is to build a local or state consumer coalition to serve as the spokesperson for the natural gas industry. Um, and here's the, the um, this is pre on the left, this is pre uh, creating this association, and this is post, and you can see the website design and copy is very similar. Uh, but on the left we have a communication and website directly from Northwest Natural about affordable energy choice in Eugene. And then on the right, we have uh, Eugene for Energy Choice, a coalition of community organisations and interested individuals uh, who are a voice for energy choice in, in Eugene. Um, they've now uh, transitioned to Eugene Residents for Energy Choice. So if you go to eugeneforenergychoice.com, it now redirects to Eugene Residents for Energy Choice.com uh, as a result of um, the petition process and the need to actually set up a petition 
committee. Um, and uh, as you can see on the, on the right there, um, the sole donor to re Eugene residents for energy choice so far is uh, North West Natural Gas Company. Um, and then there's that $350,000 expenditure on the, the petition gathering that I showed you. I should have also showed you that Eugene Residents for Energy Choice is registered to a um, address uh, in Portland, Oregon. And if you want to make donations, you need to send them to a PO box in Portland, Oregon. Um, but they still haven't received a single community donation. Um, so I'm jumping around a little bit because I, I guess I messed up my slide order. But you know, I was talking just before about uh, American Petroleum Institute and American Gas Association coordination around the Inflation Reduction Act. And we can see a little bit of this where, you know, the American Gas Association, we're so glad that there's an Inflation Reduction Act that will create these opportunities for hydrogen and renewable natural gas. ExxonMobil is also pleased that there will be uh, uh, opportunities um, for um, different types of um, energy sources like biofuels and hydrogen. Um, and uh, here's some further examples of um, work that the American Gas Association did in um, the wake of the war in Ukraine to try and promote gas as an, as an essential energy source um, and try and get additional subsidies, um, which they were largely successful in getting. Um, that was from Influence Map. They've done a really excellent job covering all these trade associations and front groups. Um, this is a really interesting one. So there's the International Gas Union, whose members include, I believe, the American Gas Association and pretty much all the, the carbon majors. Um, as you can see there, ExxonMobil, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, Sempra, LNG. Um, and that's just a summary of the sort of success that those groups have had in sort of lobbying and, and making uh, headway federally um, in sort of weakening potential regulations on gas and also sort of expanding gas production. Um, yeah, the international gas union thinks that the debate on climate change could be potentially existential for the global natural gas value chain. Um, potential regulatory changes combined with a restriction of liquidity to the sector could have highly damaging effects to the industry. Um, and so rather than ignoring the issue of climate change, they want to find a positive message to defend and enhance the role of gas in the global energy dynamic. Um, and they've been doing this sort of on a, on a regional basis. Um, so in uh, what we might call the developing world or the global south, and not that either of those labels are great, um, it's been more around the sort of necessity of, of gas as a low carbon fossil fuel option for, for development. Um, whereas in Australia and uh, North America and Europe, um, it's been more around sort of greening natural gas and talking about sort of decarbonized forms of natural gas, the, the stuff I just went through that the Northwest Natural has been engaging in. Um, but I would say, this is a little bit of a simplification. I think what we're seeing in the Pacific Northwest is closer to the sort of hard greenwashing strategy that we're seeing in Europe rather than what we would see, say, in more conservative leaning parts of the country. So I think there is some differentiation in strategies occurring depending on how tight the regulations are. So, um, so I've actually included Europe as an example, and I think this is more applicable to what the strategy is in the Pacific Northwest than what the sort of North America-wide strategy might be. So renewable and low carbon gases must play a significant role in Europe, Europe's energy future. Um, biomethane, synthetic methane, hydrogen, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's the sort of meta strategy that we're seeing. Um, all right, and I think that's, is that the end of my section? I think it might be. Cool, yeah. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time just sort of tying this together um, in some of the developments around greenwashing litigation and what could be done there. Um, and then I'll bring it to Oregon and we'll talk specifically about the place that we're in. So there aren't a lot of, in the United States, a lot of greenwashing related lawsuits as it relates to uh, gas so far, but there is one um, in DC uh, just in February, just like last month. Um, there's a really nice complaint that was filed by Public Citizen and some other groups, Client Earth, that basically challenges um, this utility for practices that are very similar to what Dan described. And DC has a Consumer Protection Act that's very similar to Oregon's as well. And so this is the first of a time uh, kind of complaint, and, and you could go back for a um, But, you know, I'm not going to read all of this, but 
basically, it's if you're a nerd lawyer, uh, it's a really nice complaint to read through. You get the factual analysis in a really deep manner and the application to law. So I, I think it could be a template for other jurisdictions that have similar um, trade practice act type, type laws. Um, you could bid for it. And it's something that has been looked at in Oregon. So um, there have been no formal complaints that we know of, uh, no legal actions taken. But there is a group of um, many dozen climate justice and environmental organizations, and include, including some, some elected officials who have asked our attorney general to look into this. Uh, have briefed the attorney general and basically said, look, here's a big portfolio of all the stuff that Northwest Natural says, and it's advertising. Here's what it says to elected officials. Here's what it says to regulators. And they are somewhat careful in sort of like packaging their information differently for different people that they're talking to. Um, sometimes they're a little bit more honest in a regulatory proceeding than they might be speaking with consumers. Sometimes not. Sometimes they're sloppy. But um, these groups basically asked for the Attorney General to look into it. And um, can you go to the next slide, please? Because we have a pretty good Unfair Trade Practices uh, Act in Oregon. And we do have an Attorney General's office in the State Department of Justice that's been pretty ahead of the game as it relates to enforcing um, rules against big polluting companies. Oregon was at the leading edge of tobacco litigation um, decades back and earned big settlements. Also ended up, uh, some of those cases went to the Supreme Court and they like limited the amount of punitive damages that you can get, so that was like a bad part of that. But um, the law is pretty okay for this type of work in trying to challenge greenwashing practices. So what the UTPA, the Unfair Trade Practices Act, does is it's supposed to protect consumers from being misled by anybody who's selling goods in our local economy. Um, and what that means is I'll get into it a little bit with gas. Could be, it depends on how you interpret the breadth of this. And maybe we'll get to find out sometime soon about how broad our, our Unfair Trade Practices Act is. Um, so under this law, there are there are different powers that are available to the Attorney General's office versus private litigants. Um, and the best case scenario from a sort of consumer stance, I would say, is that the Attorney General takes the lead on something like this. Um, and that's because they have slightly different powers than um, private litigants would have. So like the slide says, unlike a private litigant who may bring a UTPA claim only if it has suffered an ascertainable loss of money and property, as a result of a willful violation of the statute, those requirements do not apply when the state brings the UTPA claim. So they basically just have to show that factually there is misleading information being pushed around. Next slide, please. Um, and there are some good precedents in Oregon law just within you know, the last decade, including this case Johnson & Johnson, um, where the Court of Appeals found that if you know about a risk and you fail to disclose a risk, that could also be in the category of misleading information. And as, as Danny put forward, and maybe you've seen on other panels, there is a strong likelihood that Northwest Natural understands the risk of its product internally, whether it says so externally or not, because the gas industry as a whole understands this. They understand the effects of their stoves. And it strains credulity to believe that a fossil fuel utility that whose president used to be the president of the American Gas Association just knows nothing about this history. So if I was an attorney general looking to that, I would be like, hmm, maybe we should investigate a little bit. Um, so we'll see. Um, other questions that relate to this specific statute. Um, as I mentioned, a gas utility is, a, is an interesting kind of company. It's a regulated utility, which means it gets, it's, it's a sanctioned monopoly, right? Like the state says, you get to sell gas at a profit, a fixed profit, and in return, you owe us certain obligations. Um, but that also means the gas utility is representing its, its business to all sorts of different people all the time. It, it contains subsidiaries, they're selling appliances, it's got lobbyists that are saying something you know, to the legislature and regulators, they've got advertisers that are saying something different to the public and consumers. And so this huge, big mix for me, I think there's a strong argument that all these communications should be considered in the course of a gas utilities um, course of business. But I think that's something that were the attorney general or private litigant 
to bring an action, that would be probably a legal question that would have to be resolved in the courts. Um, and again, the major sort of question that a lot of this hinges on, or at least the severity of penalties that could be assessed under the UTPA, probably has a lot to do with what do Oregon gas utilities know about the health impacts of indoor gas combustion versus how they're representing the public. Danny had a bunch of great slides about how things are being presented in public, but, um, you know, and it changes from week to week. You've, we've seen a year and a half ago when, you know, a lot of the electrification advocacy started out from local governments in Oregon, Northwest Natural staff would write emails to um, local government officials and just like flatly deny. They'd say, it is a false claim that there are indoor um, air quality problems associated with combustion, they're particularly gas. And now they sort of like walk that back. Um, when that uh, New York Times article came out, there was a lot of coverage, as you might imagine, when your local gas utility is on the front of the New York Times, that can create also some local attention on, on a utility. And some local news stations picked that up and basically were saying, wow, this is weird. Like, let's talk about this. And Northwest Natural says, we're not scientists. Like, we don't, like, we don't make scientific claims. That's why we have to hire scientists to come in. And it's just like, well, you've been doing it for the last two years pretty openly and brazenly. So um, there is a lot in the record at this point in terms of communications, advertisements, and all the rest. And if you are a consumer and you are receiving information that you believe to be misleading, you might also consider making a complaint to the Oregon Department of Justice because it's one of your rights as a consumer in Oregon. Um, in a slightly different theory of accountability for, for gas utilities, it also applies to carbon majors who do business in Oregon. Um, there's recent news just at the end of last year about this huge settlement that the DOJ had with Monsanto over PCB pollution in the Willamette River. And, and basically, um, in that case, which was a, it was a result of the settlement, so we didn't get to see a trial go, we didn't see how that would result, but uh, clearly Monsanto was a little bit worried if they voluntarily agreed to a $700 million settlement. Um, that they had some legal liability coming and potentially some big punitive damages, so they, they settled that out, I'm guessing. Um, but there were claims that were made uh, in the complaint around public nuisance and trespass, which are two of these sort of common law accountability measures potentially for gas utilities that got past pleading stages. So they were going to go to trial uh, over this. Um, and the gas or excuse me, Monsanto tried to get the case dismissed by saying these wouldn't apply to a certain kind of behavior. So they're pretty pretty close parallels. There are some differences um, when you get into the details, but you know this is this is interesting precedent for um, how how this issue could be pushed as well um, by an attorney general or by private litigants. And as it relates to gas, so that in in the world of carbon majors and a lot of these um, lawsuits that are happening around the US, there's a pretty well developed um, set of what's called attribution science now that starts to link the harms associated with climate change to the emitters. And that's developed with intentional work in that area of research for over a decade now, right? So it's, it's at a more mature state. And so I think a lot of practitioners have confidence that if these cases go to trial, then they're gonna be able to convince juries that there's strong connections between emitters and, and harm. In the area of um, indoor air quality as it relates to gas, it's not potentially as developed in terms of the direct attribution. So the, the science is showing correlation, um, and it's, it's strong science, um, but it's not to the point maybe that you as like a person who um, feels like you have been harmed individually by your gas stove, it might be difficult right now to sort of like walk into court and say, you know, recompense me for that. That being said, um, there are studies that are starting to assign um, some, some attribution relations between gas stove emissions and, and public health harm. And so keep your eye on this. And as this science develops, that's going to open up a whole other realm of potential private litigation. And, um, you know, for the tort attorneys and the audience to probably salivate a little bit over that. So we'll see how that goes. And yeah, that's all I have. So um, yeah, we should go to questions. Camila, did you want to facilitate that? Or? Yeah, happy to. Happy to.
folks might be going to that. Um, so are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Um, what are the remedies available under the UTPA for private people who bring suits or for the AG? Are they different? Yeah. There, so an AG, the Attorney General has really broad options available for relief. So they can seek injunctions, they can seek settlements that sort of like set forward conditions for operation of business in the future. Um, they could also seek damages. For a private litigant to um, get damages, they have to prove some form of actual harm. They can't just say, this is misleading me. So they have to say, I was harmed. So an example of that might be, you know, I went to the appliance store the other day and I was looking for a clean appliance to heat my home or cook vegetables or whatever. And the uh, gas appliance store told me that the, the gas was really clean and there were no problems with it, right? Like that might be an example of like, hey, I spent money on a gas stove and I now I'm polluting myself. I feel like I've been cheated. Like that, that could be like a fact pattern. Um, and so if that person brought a claim like that, they could either get I think it's like $200 per instance of, of harm, or if they can demonstrate that the harm is like more than that, it's the greater of those two numbers. But what's interesting about the UTPA is that you can recover attorney's fees, um, which is always a big driver for attorneys who want to take things on, and uh, punitive damages as well. So if you can show that basically like there's extreme recklessness in or intentionally misleading consumers about stuff like that, Theoretically, there are a lot more penalties that are opened up for that. Um, so, you know, I think as probably as that for the advocates who are pushing the attorney general, there's a preference that that go because of the powers. But I, you know, I'm not a tort litigator, but it sort of speaks for itself um, in terms of the record that's available. Yeah, Paul. So, can you go back one slide, actually? <clears throat> So you might not know the answer to this, but I'm just really curious. Obviously, this is a really recent study, and I'm wondering if the states represented here are only what was the data, only states where the data was available, or it was easy to, easier to come up with the attribution, or if we could expect in the coming years to see other states have similar levels of high attribution science behind their gas gas goes and child gas. Leak. I actually don't know, but the folks behind you might actually know that answer. So. I, uh, just a little so I believe this study was um, partially a literature review, but also Illinois, California, and New York are three of the states with the highest percentages of homes with gas stoves, and so that plays into this number, I think, as well. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just just a, one further bit on that study. I uh, the American Gas Association and I think also. Northwest Natural as well attacked that study as just a, a modeling exercise, but it was a modeling exercise that's like methodological foundations were based on a, uh, meta, uh, a literature review, meta-analysis, which itself was based on like a dozen or so studies. So it was, it was a pretty strong empirical foundation to use that model in the first place, um, and there's some good art articles uh, responding to that. Um, and the gas industry always cites this one study from 2013 as like, oh look, this, this study showed no correlation, but the, the methodological issues for that study are much more profound, and, and the, one of the co-authors of that study has come out and said, the gas industry is misusing my study, essentially. So, yeah, that, that's part of the, again, sort of relying on the sort of the, the wonky or sort of technical nature of some of these things to sort of disinform. Oh, we have two questions. One in front and then back. Oh, thank you for your question. Am I loud enough? <laughs> thank you for your presentation. I, I see a lot of parallels between everything you've shown. Like fertilizer industry in Florida, something that we've observed is that often they do their own studies and it's very clear that they're purposely not studying certain things because they don't want to have results, right, for the public to see. So my question is, was it revealed through records why oil and gas industry was studying the effects of climate change internally? <laughs> you know, why so many studies? Um, I, I don't know, Corey. If well, I, I think some of it was, at that time, they were an energy company, and they were hiring the, you know, the best scientists in the world, and they wanted to look at what was going to be the most sustainable energy. Yeah. yeah. They, had, they had some early programs to develop it. 
They also move some of their infrastructure um, based on sea level rise projections they were studying. So that's, yeah. that's always been a really damning fact to me. <laughs> yeah, they, they also put in some gas pipes and they use climate modeling to make sure that those would survive even if the rest of us didn't. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's worth noting that in the development of the disinformation strategies from the carbon majors that they at some point we're like legitimately assessing risk and trying to figure things out because that's that's really common in industries to figure out like okay what's going to be our burden that's why gas utilities and industries have been studying indoor health harms of gas since the 1970s or 80s right like they need to know if they're going to get sued kind of like what they're on the hook for but the choices to like repress that or, or run pr campaigns this came decades after these, these scientific studies first came and then a lot of that uh, just really quickly, a lot of like their funding then ended up, once they decided that they didn't want to publish the uh, real findings, went towards debunked uh, theories about what else could be causing climate change, like solar radiation. I think we have a question in the back. Yeah, I just wanted to hear back. I'm just really intrigued by this consumer protection approach. Um, and I get like, I think the big answer is Attorney General enforcement is the better is the better outcome. But for, and from the private case standpoint, like in the Washington D, or the in the DC case, or how am I working other states? I just wonder how you thought through. I understand the um, you say you're buying a stove from an appliance marketer of some type, but when you're suing a utility under the consumer protection theory, you have you know you're often in a monopolized market where you have no choice as a consumer. So how do you think about the harms there? Which I, I just, I'm wondering if how you thought through that or how you've encountered that in these cases before. Because these net zero claims and stuff strike me as the most particularly pernicious form of sort of deceptive business practices. But they're just sort of being applied to a, a monopolized uh, product that nobody has any choice in being harm in the choice that they make for what they're purchasing. So I don't know how you would use that theory there. Sure. So again, with the caveat that I am not a tort attorney, and I'm sure that people who are in that like direct practice will see the angles a lot more than I do, but in Oregon, um, in Northwest Natural Service Territory, they have a subsidiary that's an appliance store that's selling directly. So like, you know, there's a corporate umbrella aspect where that's a lot closer. Um, but you know, I could sort of imagine. Uh, all, one thing I didn't talk about is product liability claims also could be a form of, of litigation in Oregon. Um, I'm less expert, I haven't briefed it fully, but it's something that we've like seen and have started to consider as something that we could look at. Yeah. Um, I've got but, some what? I've got, got an idea. Cool. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's a good question. I think perhaps, you know, the, the hypothetical ideal plaintiff in that scenario might be just sort of speculating here, someone who's perhaps looking to, is building a new home um, at, at some point in time and is deciding between whether they're going to get gas, based water heating and cooking or, or electric alternatives and Northwest Naturals uh, inducing them in some way because they do offer subsidies um, to new homeowners to go with gas and they're talking about how their appliances are so efficient and you don't need to worry about the health qualities and it's a decarbonizing gas system and all these sorts of things, and that is materially persuasive to that person in their choice of which of whether they're going to outfit their home with gas or electric appliances, you know. And then it turns out perhaps that their children have asthma risks. That would maybe be the perfect point of that I could dream up just now, yeah, yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, in the back. Uh, I'm at the University of Victoria Environmental Law Center. We're working with a number of environmental groups in Canada. Uh, because the government of Canada is rewriting their deceptive advertising legislation this month. And we're going to make submissions. We want to find provisions where citizens can bring action and get punitive damages for deceptive advertising. Not, not the Attorney General, but, but citizen kind of suits. And we're just looking for precedents, so let us know if you if you're not in it. But we really want to solve it too, though. We, we're proposing. Uh, Conspiracy uh, climate disinformation is one provision, and a few other things, but uh, any goodness you got, all the years.
Yeah, I'm just going to be patriotic really quickly. And there's, I think, been cases brought against utilities and gas producers for greenwashing and, and false advertising in Australia. I don't know if they have a damages component, but if you haven't looked at that yet, I think one is against Origin Energy and another one is against Santos. There's definitely one against Santos, but yeah, I can give you my business card if you want to follow yeah, up. We have more with some of that. Yeah, cool. Any other questions? If not, then I think we can wrap up the panel um, and just give a final round of applause for the panel.